The Cloud Foundry Foundation is our sponsor here for our podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. Our discussion, the path emerging as organizations move beyond the confusion of disruption and take the journey to transformation. We'll explore the new concepts of multi-cloud and how it relates to open source app development and management at scale. Cloud Foundry gives companies the speed, simplicity, and control they need to develop and deploy applications faster and easier. Learn more about Cloud Foundry at cloudfoundry.org. I'm Kyle McDonald. Uh, welcome to the New Stack podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit here in Santa Clara, California. I'm joined by Lee. Hey, guys. Hey, Lee Calcota. I'm here with the New Stack. And uh, we're joined today with two guests from Rantus and Redis Labs, and I'll let you guys uh, and gals introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jason Benner. I'm the Chief Architect of Marantis. Uh, hi, I'm Lena Joshi. I'm VP Product Marketing at Redis Labs. Yeah, thanks. Very cool. Thank you guys for coming, joining us today. So, uh, a couple of things. Let me start out with the beginning. What do you think of the show? You've, you've been around, you've gotten to sort of feel the vibe. Um, I'm impressed, to be honest. Uh, I see a lot of uh, really large companies have adopted Cloud Foundry. Uh, it's really good to see this kind of momentum behind technology like Cloud Foundry. I've been working with Cloud Foundry off and on for many years, and it's nice to see it's making it solidly into the mainstream and becoming a solid platform. platform. Do you guys end up bumping into to customers that have and are running Cloud Foundry already? And just, um, do you, I take it there's kind of an, obviously since you're here at the, the summit, you're, you know, you're certainly paying attention to the, not only the space, but the technology. Um, what's been your experience with customers and their adoption so far? So, um, by the way, um, we announced a, an integration with Cloud Foundry at this show, and uh, that has been mostly been driven by customer demand. So, it can it, first of all, it talks to what kind of overlap we're seeing between our customers and customers using Cloud Foundry, and then second of all, um, it has also opened a number of doors for us because it's becoming a requirement for us to be integrated with Cloud Foundry uh, for uh, numerous large organizations, uh, so that we become available as a service Redis and the enterprise Redis services available to their developers. It's very nice to see more and more data services becoming available for Cloud Foundry because without that persistent data tier, it's very hard to achieve real agility with applications. So Cloud Foundry can't realize its potential without that. That makes sense. And um, Lena, you're with Redis Labs, and you, you were saying earlier, you, you guys have two offerings, a SaaS-based and an, uh, an on-prem enterprise-based. Um, is there a difference in the way that you, you know, those two offerings are adopted in context of your Cloud Foundry? Or? Um, uh, so our SaaS offering runs on various infrastructure as a service clouds, various platform as a service public clouds. Uh, the integration with Cloud Foundry is primarily driven by private cloud adoption of of Cloud Foundry, so there are a number of organizations that are running their own private clouds using Cloud Foundry, and that the particular integration was driven by those organizations. Got it. Yeah, OpenStack is building out an app catalog called Murano, which includes Cloud Foundry in various forms as a self-service deploy for people to build and deploy their Cloud Foundry for your uses, and then we need more data services brokers integrated into that. So does that mean it's going to be very easy to deploy Cloud Foundry on top of an OpenStack? Is that exactly? We want to enable people because that's one of the core asks: is how can I get my Cloud Foundry for my individual developers, my testing, and for my production self-service? Cool. So, what are developers asking you for? So you one of the one of the reasons why we asked you to right as special cool guests was I want to know what developers are looking for. What are they asking for? How are they, what did they, how do they see Cloud Foundry? You know, kind of, I'm just throwing a couple of questions out there, but I kind of would just love to hear what you guys hear from developers. I see the vast bulk of developers not wanting to have any concern about the infrastructure and just have all of the components that they need to develop and test their application or component readily available so they can live in Eclipse, write their code, push a button, and push it through the test organ infrastructure which builds all of their requisite platform services necessary so that it's tested in a relevant way, quickly and painlessly, rather than having to become an expert in all of those technologies. So that's why the self-service for Cloud Foundry becomes important and self-service for the data service tiers. 
I, I would echo those comments. I've been I've been listening to the same kind of comments coming from developers. They do not want to think about the operations underlying their services. Uh, they want they want uh, you know everything to scale seamlessly, be highly available. They not have to worry about it, but they do want to know. You know, at least in the context of Redis and Redis Labs, they do want to see what is the response time they're getting from Redis so that they can optimize the application. Uh, they want to monitor and see what type of load pushes what kind of buttons inside of Redis, basically. And now we're able to offer that. It's interesting you mentioned that developers don't want to know that much about operations because that runs counter to what we all think, but is an interesting theme of Cloud Foundry, right? which is that you don't know a lot about the operations with Cloud Foundry. And you're trusting a lot of that to the platform, right? So is maybe Cloud Foundry good for people, you know, for people who just want to be developers and don't want to be DevOps? Is that a... I, I think that using a, plat a platform service like Cloud Foundry abstracts you from a lot of the lower level DevOps concern, but you still have to think about the operational pieces for your individual application but you no longer have to be concerned about provisioning virtual machines and building your network in security and isolation. The platform's taking care of that for you. That was too deep, but yes. And I, I, will, I will repeat that I think what Cloud Foundry is bringing to the table is a level of agility for the developers. They can move faster, worry about less of the operations. The Cloud Foundry admins, though, they have to worry about admin, uh, about the operations piece, and that separation of duties becomes important in enabling this agility. So, uh, Redis, you, uh, it was Redis Conf last week. Yes. Tell me a little bit about it. So, at Redis Conf, which had about thirteen hundred registrations, and uh, you know, almost a thousand people showed up. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, great content created by the community with people like Netflix, Apple, uh, Intuit, Walmart. All of them were there. Um, we what, might be having to podcast from your conference next year. <laughs> yeah. you, we might be. Uh, Salvatore <laughs> San Filippo, the creator of Redis, was also there. So it was an awesome community event. And uh, what Salvatore unveiled at the conference was the ability to create modules for Redis. So basically enhance Redis in a variety of different directions um, with access to the internals and a fully backward compatible API. So you could now see yourself creating a graph operations module for Redis, a linear algebra model for Redis, a new probabilistic data structure inside of Redis, all with access to underlying fundamental inter Redis internals and with the backward compatibility. So as a developer, this was very exciting because now not only can you roll your own, but also you have the confidence to make that investment because it's going to be backward, backward compatible all the time. And secondly, Redis Labs uh, announced the availability of Module Hub, which is like a marketplace for modules. We will be providing the awesome. certification for these modules so that they can work with each other and with enterprise versions of Redis as well as open source versions of Redis compatibly as, and get access to sort of the users of enterprise Redis. Well, that's fantastic. So there's both... Um sort of another platform has emerged, and it sounds like Redis and its modularity has be starting to become that. Which we, is we are certainly seeing a lot of excitement around that. Uh, we, you know, it would be a little premature for us to call it that, but we like to think of it as an in-memory database platform because you mm -hmm. now basically have multi-model capabilities inside of Redis. I guess time will tell what, what new modules are developed and what, uh, but the notion also outside of just, you know, sort of yet another platform, if, if we can call it that just yet, but also the notion of sort of yet another marketplace. And it sounds like you, you guys at Redis Labs are bringing that concept forward and it sounds like it's a, a curated it, app marketplace. It will, it will be certified and verified. So it's basically to reduce the risk of deployment for users more than anything else, and also to give developers a platform to showcase the offerings. Uh, there are already several modules on there. For example, graphics image processing. There is an author security related module, an auth module there, a graph operations module. So the, the thing behind modules is it, it lets you move very quickly and, uh, and create new functionality that will be available with the high performance scaling and high availability of Redis. So application catalogs are no stranger to, to you, Jason, with, uh, with you guys leading the Murano initiatives. So just... right. 
we really see that the core of developer productivity comes from having the self-service catalog of all of the components or the bundled versions of the application infrastructure that they need to work with. And once that's available and it exists for the developer, for the, the, tape, the QA people if they have such, for the production operations, you unlock your overall factory floor for production of software because the bulk of your time is usually spent building the environments for your software. And if you have something that builds that for you, you can focus on your software. Beautiful. I, I, you know, I had a, just this question come, come to the back of my mind, and it's just, um, you know, there's multiple ways that Cloud Foundry gets deployed. Um, sometimes Cloud Foundry gets deployed using its own tooling with, with Bosch. Um, other ways in different public clouds or in, on, you know, on customer prem. And um, I know from an OpenStack perspective, sometimes that's, um, beside OpenStack, and other times, you know, Jason, that's, you know, Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, statistically, or just how often do you see customers doing Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack versus next to it? And does, does one typically come into an organization I've before the next? I've mostly open, a Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. The, the core goal of this is to have a consistent set of API tooling for deploying for your infrastructure as code and using OpenStack, whether it be on bare metal with Ironic or through KVM or in containers to provision your workload so that you have that consistency. And also, people are spinning them up and spinning them down, and multi-tenancy requires many instances sometimes. Have you, have you, ever, you ever see the need um, for IaaS orchestration that, that OpenStack is really focused on um, go away in the face of you know, a Cloud Foundry? Or? In the modern world, workloads, you, you're dealing with power log demand curves rather than sort of sinusoidal demand curves, and that requires the ability to either 100x over-provision for static provisioning or deal with dynamic workloads, which requires an IIS and an API. Got it. So I was wondering if you could tell us, uh, about a month ago, uh, there was a, wow, it's been almost two months now, uh, there was an announcement about Intel and Mirantis and CoreOS working together around the universal resource scheduler. And, you know, I don't know if you can get into, if you want to get into a lot of details there, but what I'm more curious about was, uh, you know, how are developers talking to companies like Intel and Mirantis uh, about their requirements, right? How are they, you know, are they asking you in problem statements? Are they telling you about things they'd like to do? You know, how did you guys decide well, what we're seeing is that other than in the small startups, the vast bulk of the developers want to sit in their Eclipse editor with their jar or their Python code open and deal with the rest of, have something else deal with the rest of the universe. So this universal API platform is about enabling infrastructure's code up the entire stack for everybody um, and using a pass platform, whether it be Kubernetes or Cloud Foundry, as a key enabling labor a layer for people. And given the shift in OpenStack towards containers for applications, there's also a move afoot to containerize the OpenStack itself so that the OpenStack can benefit from the same kind of application orchestration and resiliency that you can build into a containerized platform, like Kubernetes' ability to restart services and manage resources for things like controllers. Stack and eddies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very cool. And extending Kubernetes for virtual machines, not just containers. So, uh, and, and when you talk to these developers and you're, you're sort of going out there, are you finding a lot that are running workloads in multiple clouds? Are they, is this a, is that a common, you know, one of the themes today has been multi-cloud management and sort of how do you access multi-clouds? So to, today, I rarely see things running in multiple clouds. I might see a dev test in a public cloud on a production environment that's pseudo cloud internally. But as we move more to platform services that abstract the cloud away, I think we'll see more and more multi-cloud. And I can say from the Redis Labs uh, standpoint, we do see customers in all four of the infrastructure as a service clouds. We see them in AWS, in Azure, and Google, IBM. There are very, very few that are running in both. And typically, the types of things they want when they're running in both is the ability to, you know, fail over, get the high availability between mm -hmm. the clouds. So basically, they're, 
when they're running in the ch in different clouds, they're usually seeing it as risk reduction for their deployments more right. than anything else. But there's a huge cost operationally to run in multiple clouds because of inconsistent enabling services. For sure. And by the way, typically a developer will not want to talk about this. It's usually the DevOps or the ops person who will mm -hmm. be primarily concerned about reducing his risk around mm -hmm. not having a service available. Agreed. Yeah, and I suppose that that depends in part upon whether or not the developers are using the the managed services of a specific cloud and sort of inherently locking them into that cloud. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, also interesting to note, and I think it's insightful, Lena, that you said um, just the pattern that you're seeing in terms of multi-cloud, like sort of hybrid cloud, and whether it's across public clouds or if it's. I guess I can infer from that that most of the time you see that. It's between private cloud and one public cloud. That is also a very common pattern that we see where, where people have a lot of infrastructure that's running in-house. Some of it is running in the public cloud. There are also customers who are still like not able to talk about cloud, public cloud at all. And yeah. those are typically the ones you will find private clouds, private deployments, yeah. private paths. We, I see a mix of people. They want all in in the public cloud, Netflix being one of the early leaders, and a, a number of the FinServe's people where never, nothing will ever leave the walls of my data center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And many of the federal government space, other than the GovCloud piece, which is a little bit odd. Because it's not in their data center, but it's managed and secured and isolated to basic federal standards. I suppose, you know, Kyle, along with that, there's that promise of portability in that multi-cloud story. And, um, you know, certainly, you know, the promise of containers is sort of predicated upon, port, you know, portability. Absolutely. Being a little bit lighter weight, easier to package, easier to mm -hmm. move around. Um, you know, speaking of containers, how has that touched, um, you know, y your worlds? Um, so Redis, by the way, is the number one database deployed in containers. It's, done, it's based wow. on a survey done by uh, huh? Datadog. Uh, sometime in the October time frame. And one of the big reasons for this is containers, I think, are still nascent. And the, the connectivity of containers to storage <laughs> has not particularly been solved yet. And this is the reason, since Redis runs in memory as an in-memory service, this is it becomes a perfect scenario where you would deploy tons and tons of Redis as your first responder and often only database because your containers are ephemeral. So um, we are definitely seeing a lot of popularity for Redis because of the in-memory role that it plays. Um, we are not yet seeing a lot of production deployments of containers. Yeah. I've seen almost no production deployments of containers today, but everybody has some project to containerize everything with a production roadmap for 2017. I would agree with that. And I, I hesitate to even venture into this, but earlier on, on another podcast, we were talking about unikernels and kind of, you know, the, the next sort of disruptor even to potentially to containers. And so um, I'll venture this question. Has that entered into any of your customer conversations? Or just, Could you, know, you define what a unikernel is, if that's what you said? Yeah, sure. It, it is what I said. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not the, the authority just, just yet, uh, but uh, unikernels are this notion of being able to eliminate some of the layers that you'll find in a stack today? Oh, absolutely. I see a move to that, but it's going to take a while for the risk management people to understand and move forward. But, you know, as a, for a, in the OpenStack side, as a hypervisor play, there's probably, there's only about five or six things I need besides the mechanics for building the OBS stuff. I don't need the rest of that, mm. and all of those become mm. attack services and maintenance nightmares. Mm. So the tighter and bulk out the images. I mean, you know, Ubuntu, you can do a 256 meg image, but with the unikernels, you can get them down into kilobytes. You know, kilobytes. So yeah. is it like a stripped down version it's of containers? It's absolutely stripped down. Yeah. Well, at the host OS, if you're just servicing containers, you don't need all of the normal utilities and tools and libraries. You just need enough to support the Caner OS and, and the orchestration frameworks that they're calling in. So I, I think that this puts the OS vendors into an interesting place because more and more value is being re removed from the base OS. And we may be seeing that with, you know, um, what was some of these, you know, much smaller operating systems, CoreOS, Snappy. Alpine Linux would be on there. Yeah, Project mm -hmm. Atomic. You know, you kind of yeah, I like Project Atomic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good. Um, do you, how do you guys actually 
or de- from a Mirantis perspective, do you guys um, uh, deploy with uh, or and or? I, it sounds like you might just. So at this point, we're still we're still deploying Ubuntu and Red Hat for the base OSs, but more and more of the components are being containerized. And once the containerize is done, then we're in a position where we're not depending on host services and then frees us up to make a different choice. Whether we will or not is a different question, but we're now free to make a different choice. So you're living the same journey as your customers? Yes. How is that? <laughs> so they, you just mentioned they've got a, they're doing it in 2017. It sounds like you're doing it in 2016. Yes. Well, you have to be you know, one chapter ahead, right? Yeah, right. Eat your own dog food. It's a, yeah, it's a Scott McNeely saying, I think. So, yeah. how's it going? Like, was that easy? Was that an easy mind shift for the developers? And is that, and is that trend towards containerizing sort of OpenStack and OpenStack services something that's also happening in OpenStack? I think, well, the Cola project was a, the first leader in that. I've kind of lost track of what happened with it. But the uh, Stack and Eddie's Stack and people grabbed that and growing it. The Marantz people are doing their own separate initiative. We're trying to line up with the other players for that announcement. That's all I'll say about that. Very cool. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, we're, well, what are we about? Um, halfway through the Cloud Foundry, the, the Cloud Foundry Summit, um, how has the conference been for you guys thus far? Any any takeaways that you know? Any interesting talks that? Um, um, so the, I mean, so far uh, at the at the show, we've we've met with a whole bunch of uh, really large companies. Uh, some of them well into their Cloud Foundry deployments. A lot of them also creating their own services around the Cloud Foundry deployments. Uh, around the Cloud Foundry de- deployments, uh, it it has been interesting to uh, to to see the momentum and the community that has gotten built around this project, which I think started about eight years ago. Uh, so. It, it's been a fun experience for us. Great mm-hmm. conversations, uh, really interesting people. And so, Lena, just in coming to understand uh, more of your offering at, at Redis Labs, um, you know, I, I think we talked earlier a little bit about um, some of the competition that you bump up against, and and you know, in my mind, one of those from a SaaS offering ends up being um, AWS um, Elasticash, and and I you thought that you might be able to explain. Part of the decision-making process that customers go through, and, and what weighs in on what you know where they. Of land. course. Um, so one of the things uh, that we see about Redis is once it starts getting deployed and used uh, extensively, people want it to be highly available. They want it to be persistent. They do not want to lose their data. Uh, and uh, Redis gets used as a cache, a database, and a message broker. So you can imagine how. Uh, horrific it must be for people if they if they lose it uh, when they're using it as a database, for example. But even if you lose it, if you're using it as a cache and you don't have persistence turned on, if your cache is down, that's still a huge load on your database. Everything slows down. So you want it to be highly available. It's just the it, it's the f- first responder database that your data goes into. Uh, so one of the big reasons that people choose Redis Labs over uh, most other Redis services is typically for this a huge reason of high availability, instant automatic failover, and the fact that we have taken away all the operational hassle be- behind scaling, deployment, configuration uh, of Redis. Uh, so if you were to use Redis in pretty much any other way, you would have to manually configure it, you would have to uh, change all the endpoints if you scaled it. It would be, it would be a lot of work, and we've solved that problem. By creating a container-like structure around Redis, around open source Redis, so there's 100% support for open source Redis, and we've added a proxy, uh, a cluster manager, and an API, which helps us solve the scaling, uh, the high availability, and the um, management problem very gracefully and elegantly. So earlier you mentioned a new capability that's been added to to Redis, uh, the open source, and it's um, the notion of, of modulars and modularity. Have, have, have you guys at Redis Labs um, either come forward with, with modules or are there some in the works? That... Uh, yes, absolutely. There are about uh, a few modules that are already on redismodules.com. Uh, there are some modules that you can use, for example, to do search. So Redis Search is a module that we've, we've already launched and uh, it's available. Uh, and it's already showing uh, showing great char- performance characteristics, 32 times faster than um, specialized search engines like Solar and Elasticsearch. Uh, 
Uh, so the in-memory capabilities of Redis really lend a, a great deal of um, weight to, to, cap to uh, new modules. Uh, we also have a graphics and image processing module, uh, a, a graph operations module, and so on already there. That's fantastic. I had no idea. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's been fun. Wow. So uh, imagine what this summit looks like next year, and tell me, do you have any predictions? What do you want to see? What do you think the world looks like in a year? I think we will see in a year. We'll see a lot more adoption of pass and containers and continuous delivery, and we should be seeing some major success stories coming in of people who kind of reinvented their development process and their architecture to use Cloud Foundry and Redis and other capabilities and they're just killing it. Um, I predict that next year Redis Labs Enterprise Cluster will be the number one database on Cloud Foundry. Oh wow, <laughs> that, was, that was great. Well done. Well, looking forward to it and we'll have to get together next year and see how you did. Thank you so much for Thank the time. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for coming guys. The Cloud Foundry Foundation is our sponsor here for our podcast from the Cloud Foundry Summit in Santa Clara, California. Our discussion, the path emerging as organizations move beyond the confusion of disruption and take the journey to transformation. We'll explore the new concepts of multi-cloud and how it relates to open source app development and management at scale. Cloud Foundry gives companies the speed, simplicity, and control they need to develop and deploy applications faster and easier. Learn more about Cloud Foundry at cloudfoundry.org.